My name is Tommy Wilson. I'm the Ranger Coordinator on Mornington Island uh, for the Wellesley Island Rangers. We are based in the lower Gulf of Carpentaria. This was a, a, a new project for the Wellesley Island Rangers. We started this project back in uh, 2019. And the reason why we started this program is there wasn't any recording or information of shorebird in the lower Gulf, especially around the Wellesley Island region. It is very important to protect the migrating shorebirds that visit our country. We want to protect them from animals, locals, but most importantly, making sure they are relaxed and feeding and making sure they get enough food supply to travel back up north. There are many different species of uh, migrating shorebird that visit the Gulf, uh, particularly around the Wellesley Island and the Mornington Island uh, region. Also, they do have a cultural connection to the local traditional language group in the Wellesley Island, the Lardel, Cardell, and Yungal people. In particular, one bigger wader bird that has a long beak, which we call Kuatu. It is the Far Eastern Curlew. He's one of the biggest wader bird, but also he's on the most critical endangered list. That one has a cultural connection to the local people. The Kuaku is an important bird to the people. All, all shorebirds are cultural significance. They actually are our tide indicators to let us know when the tide has changed. Sometimes at night when we are traveling between islands or islands or just on the south side of Mornington and we hit a sandbar or get stuck on a reef, and the tide is out, where you are sitting pretty much high and dry until the tide starts changing. So that'll take you up to an hour to two hours. So at night when you can't see the tide change, well, these shorebirds are out there feeding. They feed day and night. But as the tide change, they start calling out to each other, telling each other the tide's going to change all their feeding grounds going to be covered by the incoming tide. So they start chirping to start moving to the roosting areas where this give us that indication that, okay, the tide change, get ready. The tide is coming in. Um, so that way we are prepared for the incoming tide. These, th these birds are very, you know, they're very, very amazing. Uh, the way they travel from the northern hemisphere down to the southern hemisphere. When we'd have, when they're down here visiting us during the wet season and come May, when the temperature started to get a little bit cooler, well, you start seeing these little fellas uh, migrating north. That tells us that, oh, yep, yeah, there's winter coming up soon. That gives us the indication to get ready for the winter. We live around our cultural season and during the winter time, it's actually the best time for hunting. So this is for the local people in, within the Welshley Island. So when, when the old people 
No, when they see these shorebirds, migrating shorebirds, you know, start moving about and, and leaving the island, they know let's get, we're going to get ready for our southeast wind. Now it's going to be winter soon. Um, when they leave, they bring the southeast wind. And that's, that's, that's for us to get ready now to be, be prepared because we got this big wind blowing, going to be blowing from the southeast direction and yes after that so we get like you know 30 to 40 knot wind blowing straight up the yeah from the south it's turtle mating season when we see the shorebird back in our region we then know we notice the turtles are laying so the kuahu they are now critically endangered and we're afraid of the species disappearing for good all the shorebirds within the lower gulf and around the Wellesley Island are important to the traditional owners. Growing up on Mornington, um, I noticed a lot of these birds. I mean, I noticed them in big flocks. As I grew uh, as an adult and, and hunting around the islands um, and the Wellesley and particular Mornington, anywhere on the south side, there were a lot of fights and curlew on the south and north side of the island. Not until we did this particular survey of all our migrating shorebird that I didn't, I, I realized the kuaku, the fiest and curlew was on the endangered list. Seeing that bird, like I said, a lot back in the early days growing up here, make me wonder, okay, what's going on here? Seeing it on the critically endangered list, well, that's that kind of um, uh, boost our our interest more as from a local perspective, the, the traditional owner's side to the Western science as, as, as the, the Wellesley Island Ranges uh, shorebird project where we did the studies on um, these birds or survey around and see how much, actually how much kuaku, faist and kurlu um, are in our region. The numbers, the numbers vary in areas, but we we are seeing lesser kuaku than we used to see before in areas where there were flocks of them, you know. And that's, I guess, that's part of our survey um, methods now. Um, just changing it up this year, we're going to try and see if uh, during our, our, our migrating shorebird this year, get as much numbers of the kuaku, the fires and kurlu, um, just to make that criteria in a flyway. Uh, having the designated area, uh, hopefully we can uh, protect these uh, species, especially the shorebirds that, that are endangered or on the vulnerable um, list or critically endangered list where we could uh, start protecting um, these species, you know, up along the flyways. We could get uh, extra fundings to uh, put up signs to help protect when they are in their region feeding or roosting areas. Uh, it's very important, in, um, especially when, you know, you're doing surveys um, in areas um, and you find this particular shorebird species, but he's got a leg tag on it, you know? Uh, he's got a, um, a, a colorful tag and it make you wonder, oh, okay, where this fella come from? And it's good because you can see we've we've got the that international connections here in the in the in the Gulf, where it was amazing to see some of these tag species of shorebirds, but also was interested to see where they were tagged and w what what country they came from. They actually feeds. In the southern hemisphere, so they come down here. They'll feed down here for eight months. Then, when when we see them uh, migrating back up north, so they track up north to their breeding ground, so their mating ground. So um, as they go up to 
uh, north up the the um, the flyway, they have a quick stop at at the Yellow Sea. So that's in China. Get enough energy to fly to either Siberia or Alaska, uh, Russia. Um, yeah, it's amazing where these little guys go. You know, it's amazing to see the species, how much species of, sh of uh, shorebird there is out there, but how small they are. You got the little ones, you know, wingspan of um, uh, 15 centimeters, little small little little birds where they travel so far. And then you got the bigger weight of birds, you know, that, that do the same. So um, it's amazing. Yeah. How far they travel. Backpackers with wings. And, and that's the beauty about being a ranger on Mornington. There's hardly any recording of any of our species here. With not having that cultural experience, cultural names for the birds, I guess this is something um, we were looking into naming all these uh, different shorebirds in our local traditional names. We've got a we've got a few that I know the Kuakus, our Fais and Curlew, um, our little sandpipers, it's called the Jinjin. That's that's a um fair bit of different species of bird that has got a local cultural name. Talking to our old elders um, on the island regarding the shorebirds, they didn't know little about them and just telling them about their background and where they've traveled from and how far they travel like our old, our old um, elders they just you know they just light up they just get really amazed of of, um, of how far these little birds come from and they get so interested in our survey work and and whatnot they they ask um to come along to um you know to to get to know the shorebirds a little bit more better. We're sharing the science side, I guess, to the cultural side, you know, to our old people. And the old people actually coming back with the cultural um, answers for us, you know, of, their, of how they grew up alongside these birds and what they call them in that language name, like the, the um, uh, kuaku. We've got the the pie and sooty oyster catchers. I mean, they're locals, but they also they also play a big part in their culture, um, especially on my family surname Wilsons. We've we've actually got two totems for the men's. That totem is is Danba. Danba mean. The shovel nose shark. And then for the women, their totem is Gadagu. Gadagu means the pie oyster catcher. And that's our, our women. That's their totem. Yeah, so they the oyster catchers, the pie oyster catchers. The Gadagu out there with the shore birds. And if there's a, you know, a predator flying by, they're actually the first one to get up and start screaming and calling out and telling. Yeah, they they, they look out for... Um, all the shorebirds. Dad, I always wondered where they let you know they live for these these little short months, and then we see them back again. I'm thinking, what? Yeah. So um, a little, I, a little did I know, knew about the shorebird until we actually did um, this survey back at um, uh, 2018, and yeah, I got to know them more and and understand. Um, their their travels and where they come from, how long they stay down here, um, and um, how long for feeding before they head back up. Um, and that's where I thought about it then and thinking, wow, these fellas they down here during our summer, and then when our winter kick around, they gone up to the other the northern summers. So um. Yeah, what a life these little birds having, eh? Chasing the everlasting <clears throat> summer. The first time, the first time we um, we we found a tag bird, and this one was a great knot. Um, and I was like, "Wow, where did this bird come from?" You know. So 
with this great north, I end up looking um, at the um, at his. Uh, they had a leg, a flag on it. The color of the flag was um, black over white. Uh, as we as we were doing these surveys, uh, we have these uh, particular little survey identification books, and at the back of that, it's got um, the the leg leg color flags. Um, which um, we looked that up, and uh, we didn't realize um, that that particular bird was tagged in China. So um, yeah, that was amazing to um, to uh, capture that, but also know where this bird was uh, was tagged and how far it's traveled. Yeah, so we do uh, two types of survey. Uh, we do the the low tide survey where all the shorebirds are out there feeding. So um, we, we go out, get some counts of the species of um, uh, migrating shorebirds are out there, um, where it's, you know, down from a, a little uh, great to sandy plovers, um, a little um, stints, fires and curlers, wimbrels, great knots. So... There's uh, um, a lot of a lot of um, I didn't realize how much um, migrating shorebird species there were out there. There's a lot, and the other one is on the roosting on the high tide. So where we find them all um, together roosting in in areas. So uh, we get to um, uh, you know. Uh, get some numbers and identify what species are uh, at these uh, roosting um, areas. Yeah, I I, I really appreciate uh, these little birds, um, the, the migrating shorebirds. Um, ever since I I started, um, you know, doing the Western science side of things and knowing um, uh, where these little birds come from, um, and I've 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 uh, I've built a very very big respect. For them, because uh, to see how far they travel for a you know from a small bird to a big wader bird, um, they travel they, they they travel a long way just for a feed. When they're down in our region, we look after them, fatten them up, and then when it's um, crucial time now to go migrate north to their. Um, to their breeding grounds. Well, I talk about they gotta stop. They do one more stop before they get to the breeding ground is China. China at the at the Yellow Sea. You know they've got these nice big mud flats there, um, and and this is this is a big bit of a worry within the flyway is most of their feeding grounds are being um, populated or overgrown. Um, by humans, they are polluted in areas. So um, the shorebirds, you know, especially when they leave the southern hemisphere and travel up north, they burn a lot of fat going up. So they definitely need that last bit of energy to get to their breeding grounds. And unfortunately, they're getting intercepted there or they're not, healthy enough to travel to their breeding grounds because all of their feeding grounds are being overtaken, overgrown by human population. There's a lot of marine rubbish out there, uh, which are, are, are really concerned, especially for our shorebirds that are going to be feeding on the, the foreshore areas. We get uh, uh, bottle tops, you know, the lids and that, so the birds could um, eat all that, can't digest. Protecting feeding grounds, making sure and educating the local community about, you know, protecting, looking after the shorebirds in the area, making sure that they, they do have um, enough food, feed. So sign in key feeding areas where there's no you know no interruption even from 
a family walking, you know, a person walking their dog. They don't let it off the leash and go and scatter and start these birds. You want them to save all their energy because they do got to fly a, a long way north. We're trying to reduce the pollution on our foreshores and in our areas. So, you know, try and remove all these uh, plastic bottles, um, ghost net, all sort of marine rubbish that could potentially harm our shorebirds, but also um, our, our marine animals that we have in the Gulf of um, and around the Wellesley Island. Having wild cats in a key well-known roosting area for migrating shorebird um, is a big worry. Well, we know what um, a cat's like. It's, um, it's a natural predator and um, that could um, potentially you know, wipe half of our, our, our native and migrating um, birds here on the island. To, to control that is have um, trail cameras, set up some camera traps, um, see how much cats in the area to record. Uh, the, the main thing is making sure we've, we've actually got the numbers there so we can get out and do these sort of um, surveys. But also culling to um, eliminate these sort of uh, issues now from um, our, our migrating shorebirds, but also our, our native animals here on the island. Having to start this survey um, back in 2018, uh, we got the opportunity to invite uh, one of the shorebird, migrating shorebird um, expert over to, um, to do some training on and identifying the shorebirds. So we got a, a, a well-known um, shorebird expert uh, by the name of Roger Gents, who came out uh, for a week to do some on-ground surveys, but also teach us um, how, how to identify these shorebirds. So from a bigger shorebird to a really small little shorebird. So um, which was really interesting to, to know the different methods and, and ways around um, identification of um, each species of shorebirds or migrating shorebird. As this training progressed and, you know, we got out on country, um, it was a good learning both side through the Western science side, but also cultural side. Roger, the, the bird expert, he was more interested in my local language name for each species of, of birds. Yeah, so, uh, and this is something like me and Roger Jens was actually talking about where have the Western science name and then we have our local name and what it is and what it means you know um in our language and have them emerge together culturally and western science yeah you know it's good i always think uh marrying the two up you know make it stronger i guess having the both together right